a lesson in how not to call names in prom two. Somebody say, help the preacher. Thank you. Thank you. Some of you didn't think I needed help, and I appreciate that too. Let's stand together. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Uh, I am, I want to uh, confess to you something. Um, some weeks, um, I am behind in my study, and it's, set, it's late, it's late on Saturday, and I, I don't have, I don't have any direction, I don't have anything prepared. Now, if you were the pastor, you would do a better job than me, and you would never have that happen. Uh, but because of having guests and, and, and the, the like this week, um, I, I, time I would normally spend doing that, I was doing other things, and so... Uh, Saturday, I had this horrible guilt on me because it, it was late. Our guests had finally left, uh, and I, here I am trying to get my act together. And um, I just opened the opened the word of the Lord, and immediately it was almost it was almost as though it was almost as though the Lord was saying, "All right, I got you, <laughs> and I've got something I want you to say." And I, I, I knew within, I knew within th three or four minutes that it's like some Sundays, I, nothing, I can't find gold and then their heels. And some Sundays, everything I touch turns to gold. Now this, I shouldn't say that because I won't then do good after saying that. But what I want to say is this. Occasionally, I, I, I'll stumble on something that's so good that after I'm done preaching it, I want to take the notes and send them to my friends who are better preachers than me and say, would you preach this so I can be blessed? <laughs> you wouldn't understand that feeling, but I'm going to preach today from the story of the Exodus, primarily in chapters 14 and 15. But before we get into the word of the Lord, I'd like us to pray together. And first of all, I'd like us to pray that the Lord would let us lay aside all the distractions in our life and open our hearts that he could speak to us. Would you pray that with me right now? Lord Jesus, we value your word. We honor your word. We receive it into our life. Lord, I'm praying that we would lay aside everything that would hinder the moving of your spirit. I'm praying we would receive into our heart, into our soul, that engrafted word of God, and we would be changed by it. Lord Jesus, we need it so desperately, and we are so hungry to see your work done in our lives. And we ask your anointing in Jesus' name. Somebody say, in Jesus' name. God bless you. You may be seated. Praise the Lord. So my title for this Sunday is simply this highways in low places highways in low places and as as we look at the exodus remember uh, I will assume that uh, there's maybe a couple or more people who don't have at least a rough understanding of this story and let me give you the the cliff notes version of it so we'll all be on the same page uh, the Lord made his first covenant with Abraham and that covenant continued to his son, Abraham, Isaac, and that continued to his son, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. This is God's covenantial embrace of part of his creation. The Lord found faith in Abraham. It was a faith that would pursue. If you want to understand the kingdom of God, you have to understand that essence of pursuing the presence of God, pursuing the work of God. Uh, nobody accidentally got spiritual. Nobody comes in the church and say, man, I slipped up and prayed two hours. We have to press. Can I have an amen? We have to press. And so uh, you see that in the life of Abraham. And because of that, because of Abraham's willingness to pursue, um, God makes a covenant with Abraham. And Although Egypt at one, at one time was a place of safety and a place of refuge from a famine, it would not stay that way for them. Jacob brought his family down following the path his son Joseph had taken, and 70 souls of their immediate family are in Egypt, and it is a place of blessing to them. And the Lord had told them that he would make of them there a great nation. Remember, if you will, that promise to Abraham, that night when Abraham was so disturbed in his spirit. And so, and it, the Bible says it was like a horror of great darkness was upon him. And the Lord begins to make him to know during this time, the season of his life, that although his children were going to go to Egypt, 
uh, they would not remain in Egypt and that the Lord would make of them a great nation. I want to remind you that although blessing is a part of God's process for our growth and our ministry future, and although blessing is a part of His work and His plan for our lives, it is not the only way in which God builds greatness in His church. In the same manner that God uses blessing to build greatness in ministries and in His church, He also uses suffering. Can I have an amen? It wasn't as though God was surprised by the slavery in Egypt. God was not surprised by that slavery. God said, I will there make of you a great nation. And so you see the people there. And now hundreds, hundreds of years have passed, 430 years. What was once a blessing is now a curse. And they find themselves under the hard lash of slavery and bondage. The Lord prepares a way of escape and you see you see this way of escape shown through the Lord raising up an anointed man God always uses anointed people to lead others it is the story from Genesis all the way to Revelations and so he raises up Moses and Moses is placed in a place of protection and blessing. There was a day when as a baby, his life literally was held by the slimmest of chances, it would seem. And he could have easily been part of the genocide that was being waged against God's covenant people. But God's protection was upon him. And you can't hurt what God's chosen to protect. You can rail against it. You can attack it. But if God's protection is upon it, there's not a hair of that person's head that will be singed by the attack of the enemy. I pray for God's protection on everyone in this church. I pray for God's protection upon every family. I pray for God's protection upon every young person. I pray that he would keep us. Can I have an amen? Some of you who have children or who are going through ups and downs of their walk with God. Some of you have children that have given up trying on their walk with God. I want you to know I pray that God protects their heart so it's still sensitive enough that when their life changes and when they feel themselves being perhaps more inclined toward God, they can still come to an altar. They can still repent of their sin. They can still make themselves right in the presence of God. I claim it for you and I claim it for me in Jesus and so the Lord uses Moses. You see the same process in Moses' life. It's not all blessing. It's not all suffering. But it is a combination of blessing and suffering. In his early years, he attains the heights of his society's elite. But in his middle years, his temper gets him into trouble. And he has to flee for his life. And he spends the second half of his life, or that from 40 to, to older years, to 80, literally in a wilderness, doing that most despised profession of his prior Egyptian life. That was to be a shepherd, a herder of sheep. And now you see him. You see him being prepared by God and God will bring him back. He's going to stand before Pharaoh. He's going to say, thus saith the Lord, let my people go. And this is going to be the confrontation that happens between the great power of the time, Egypt, and the promises of a little known but infinitely powerful God. Every plague that, we're going to, that comes upon Egypt is a direct challenge to an Egyptian deity. Most of you have heard me teach this or preach this. Whether it's flies, it is related to an Egyptian deity. Or whether it's boils, it's related to an Egyptian deity. Hail, the disease in the cattle, it's all related. The night of darkness and finally frogs, for example. And finally that most terrible judgment of the end where the Lord brings the death angel through the camp. And the Bible tells tells us that every house, every home, every palace, every hut, every firstborn in the land of Egypt died who was not, what? Under the blood. Those who are under the blood are saved. Pharaoh rises up in the night, the Bible tells us, and he discovers along with all of his servants that their home has been visited by judgment. They have lost that which was most dear to them. There are some losses in life that 
doesn't matter if you're doing good. Your heart is broken. It doesn't matter if you have money in the bank. Your heart is broken. So it is. So it is with Pharaoh. At this moment, at midnight, the children of Israel leave their homes. They've already eaten the Passover. Interestingly, uh, there's a little bit of trivia here in the dating of the Passover as we know at Easter. It's the same dating uh, system, and that is this. Easter, if you'll notice, it's different dates, different years. How does that happen? How do they pick? It is the first, it's the, for Easter, it's the Sunday after the first full moon of the spring equinox. So when the sun in going into the spring crosses above a plane drawn through the equator of the earth, in the winter it's below that plane, in the summer it's above that plane. Right now it's at the peak and that's why we're suffering so much. It is the first full moon. Why the full moon? Because the children of Israel leave after the death angel has passed. They don't stay home and wake up in the morning. They don't stay home and they leave as soon as midnight comes. And they walk by the light of a full moon. So it is in every generation of we sojourners in this earth. There is a darkness upon the land, but God's given you enough light to see. And enough light to journey. Yes, there's a darkness upon the land. Yes, there is changes in our society that are overwhelming to anybody who values a Judeo-Christian ethic. Yes, there is, but let me remind you, it's not the first time there's been a darkness upon the land. When God first brought His children out, they started with a great darkness upon the land, but God sent enough light that they could travel even when the darkness was upon the land. And so they travel through the night and they make their way from all over the land where they are spread in Goshen. And they all converge down in a place at the edge of the desert where the greenery begins to fade into the desert. And there is a place called Sukkoth. And there over two million of them are gathered. Over 600,000 men is the count the Bible gives us. And as the sun comes up and as they gather as quickly as they can, they encamp there. They build leafy tabernacles to protect themselves from the sun. They have the food prepared for their journey. They bake their unleavened bread and they are ready to begin the trek to the promised land. Pharaoh wakes up and he agrees, I'm going to let you go. I'm not going to pursue you. And they now are free to go. This is all told to us in the 13th chapter of the book of Exodus. And let me just say very quickly, Exodus is such an important understanding theologically it's an important understanding biblically why the same process is going to be acted out in our lives the same exodus is going to be acted out and just as they come out they cross the Red Sea and they go to a promised land so it is with every believer we repent of our sins we are baptized uh, baptism of water and we are baptized of spirit you see the same process it's not just that it's also shown in the the, the, the death and the, the, the life, the death and the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's the same repeating pattern. And it is important for us to understand this. Here they are gathered, gathered together in Sukkoth at the edge of the wilderness. And we hear, read at the end of chapter 13, there they are being led by God. They're not on the promised land yet. They've just made the first part of their journey and they are gathered and you read Read, the Lord went before them. This is 13 and 20 of Exodus. The Lord, uh, 20 to 22. The Lord went before them by day in a pillar of a cloud to lead them the way, uh, to lead them the way, and by night a pillar of fire to give them light to go by day and night. He took not away the pillar of the cloud by day, nor the pillar of fire by night before the people. All right, we're where we're supposed to be. Somebody say, thank the Lord. We have the guidance we're supposed to have. Someone say, thank the Lord. Now what, God? We're ready for you to lead us. It's not very far to the promised land. Oh, I hope you're not daydreaming on me today. I've got something to share with you. It's not very far to the promised land. It's only about 100 miles. But there's a problem between here and the, and the promised land is the land of the Philistines. 
And the Lord says, I cannot take them from where they are to the promised land because they will repent of their new freedom and they will turn back in the face of the Philistines' army. Read it. And all this is chapter 13, 14 of Exodus. They will repent. They are not ready to fight. It's only a hundred miles. Let me put this in local geography. If Charlotte is the promised land, which I like to think of Charlotte as the promised land. Thank you, Lord. If Charlotte's the promised land, where they are is only down about where Columbia, South Carolina is. I'm sorry, I couldn't make Charlotte, Egypt and say, you know, Greensboro, the promised land. I had to make Charlotte the promised land and Columbia, Egypt. You see what I'm saying? Local geography. And besides, I'm being led of the Spirit. That's all I got to say about that. And so they're not, somebody say they're not very far. Let me tell you, a strong bike rider can ride it in less than a day. A marathoner, an ultra marathoner can run it in less than 24 hours. A strong walker can do it in three days. We're not talking about that far physically. It's not a long way and God says you're not ready. If I take you that way, you're just going to be destroyed by the army of the Philistines. And and the Lord implies you're not even going to fight. When you see the army, you're going to turn back. You're going to repent of the whole thing. And you're going to go right back to where you are. So, God, if you're not going to take us where we think we ought to go, where are you going to take us? Remember the sovereignty of God? Talked about that Wednesday night. God takes them the exact opposite way. You can't blame them for it. You can't blame Moses for it. They don't have a committee. They're not sitting together saying, well, what do you think we should do? Or what do you think we should do? That's an author of confusion right there. The Spirit is leading them. But he's going the wrong way. How can you go that way, God, when we know of a surety that the promised land is that way? They are led not to the north. They are led to the south. And they make their journey toward the south. And here they are going south. They go south until they get to a mountain range known as, uh, and, and this time it's called Bel Z. Z- Zephon, Belzevon, and it is the beginning of what would, will turn into the Ethiopian highlands, those mountains that are south down the coast of the Red Sea, going south out of Egypt. And here they are. They're, they're, they're going the way. This isn't the way to the promised land. And they're going the wrong way. How can we claim you're leading us, God, when the promised land's that way and you're taking us this way? Here is what the Spirit will say. The Lord says they will repent when they see war. This is verse 17 and 18 of chapter 13. And so the Lord led the people about, or speaking in our terms, they turned the other direction, through the way of of the wilderness of the Red Sea. They're going the opposite direction of the way they should go. And they finally get down to the mountain range of Belzevon, and to the uh, west of them is nothing but the burning desert that you cannot cross. To the south of them is a mountain range that you cannot cross. And to the east of them is the Red Sea that you cannot cross. And this is the moment. Oh, the devil always waits until you are at your weakest moment to show up. When you're all excited, he's fine to let you run around and be happy with yourself. But the moment you get in a little bit of trouble, the moment someone hurts your feelings, the moment someone misunderstands you, the moment somebody who you trusted turns out to be undeserving of your trust, as soon as that happens, the devil's going to show up. And here they are. They're at the mo- their weakest strategic moment. Uh, and uh, Pharaoh wakes up and says, now's the time. I've changed my mind. I'm taking them back. He loads up his 600 war chariots. He takes his armies. He rushes south to take them. And they wake up to see uh, hope lessness to their west and hopelessness to their south and hopelessness to their east and to their north is the army that is descending upon them this scares them to death if you were there you'd have been just as scared don't act dignified you would have been just as scared you'd have been like god we didn't come here because we wanted to we prayed for deliverance We didn't pray for a wilderness. We prayed for deliverance. We never want. You led us here, God, into a situation. There's no hope that way. 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 You might call this the way of the wilderness. And some of you have been walking in the way of the wilderness. And you don't know where the answer is going to come from. But I'm here to tell you, God put you there. 
and he has a word for you there and he's going to keep you there. The people are broken. They say, Moses, was there not enough graves in Egypt? Is this a cruel trick? Ever, any of you ever carnal enough to feel that way? Don't say amen. You know who you are. That's enough. Besides, someone righteous will look down at you. So don't be giving them any ammunition. Is this a cruel trap? How am I here? There's no salvation in any direction. I'm trapped that way, that way, that way, that way. Are you sure you meant to lead me here? Are you sure the pillar of fire and the pillar of cloud led me here to this hopeless situation? And Moses, and there's some interesting, there's some interesting commentary when you read this in uh, um, some, what some of the Hebrew uh, commentators write on this. Because they separate verses 13 from verses 14. And they say verses 13, although the verses are together, is what Moses says to the people. But at verse 14, this is Moses private with God. So imagine something like this happening, if the Hebrew commentators are right, that in 13, Moses is putting on his game face. He's being positive, a good leader. We all need some good leaders, and some of you need to look at the difficulties in your life and choose to be positive, just like Moses. Can I have an amen? But they say verse 14 is a different moment. That's a private moment because of the phrase, and the Lord spoke to him, which denotes a privacy. So verse 13, here you have Moses. He's trapped. God led him here. There's no salvation that he can perceive, and the people are saying, what, there's not enough graves in Egypt for you to play a cruel trick on me like like this and Moses says to the people got that game face on do not be afraid stand still and see the salvation of the Lord which he will accomplish for you today whom you see today you will see again no more forever the Lord will fight for you you should hold your peace man that's some leadership right there some of you need to look at the trouble in your life and say, God's on my side. Some of you need to look at the fear you're living with and say, God's on my side. And people say, I don't, what do you mean by that? I don't know what I mean by it, but God's on my side. Verse 14. Verse, excuse me, verse 15 is a private conversation. Moses gets done with his message like preachers everywhere. He's like, oh, hallelujah, I did good. And he goes in the office and he falls down the chair. My God, you wouldn't understand that. No, it's just preachers who feel that way. And verse 15 is a private conversation. He's in his tent. He doesn't have to put on a game face for other people anymore. He gets to be vulnerable. And the Lord says to Moses, they're having a private conversation, Why do you cry to me? Tell the children of Israel to go forward. I know you're stuck with the enemy on one side. And I know you didn't ask for it, but I've got a word for you today. You need to get up and you need to go forward. I know you're hurting. I know you're facing dilemmas you don't have simple answers to. But I've got a word from the Lord for you here today. You need to get up and you need to go forward. You say, what does that mean? There's a mountain range that way, kind of hard to go. There is a desert that way, kind of hard to go forward. There's an army that way, kind of hard to go forward. And there's a sea that way. Uh, and I don't see how I can go forward. Well, I'm going to tell you, the God we serve is in the business of building highways in low places. Oh, I don't know if you heard me or not. I said the God we serve is in the business of building highways in low places. When you don't know where to go, there's a good chance God's building you a way right in the middle of your problem. God's building you an answer right in the middle of your discouragement, right in the middle of your loss and your pain. That's where God's building a highway. All the fearful people can ask. All they can ask is, God, why would you lead me to a grave? That's all they can ask. God, how could you lead me to a grave? Let me tell you a little secret. This is some deep theological insight for your inquiring mind. God was always leading us to a grave. But if you'll look close, you'll see the grave is empty.
Because God builds ways in low places. If the princes of this world had known who Jesus was and that he was a way maker, if they would have known that he's in the business of building highways in low places, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But because they didn't see him as a way maker, they said, if we just can get them low enough, we'll kill this church. If we can just get it low enough, we'll kill mercy. We'll kill grace. But he's a way maker. Moses, I've got a word for you. Find the lowest spot in your life and start walking toward it. Isaiah, Isaiah said it like this. And he says it in the form of a question. Oh, I love some Isaiah. I'm going to do an extended Bible series on Wednesday night on the book of Isaiah very soon. Okay? Are you not the one, this is Isaiah 51 10, are you not the one who dried up the sea? <laughs> the waters of the great deep? Are you not the one that made the depths of the sea a road? For the redeemed to cross over. <laughs> Oh, my brother, my sister, let me be honest. In your life, you're looking at an uncrossable ocean and you don't see a solution. But while you're standing there, perhaps even doing like I do and feeling a little sorry for yourself, even when you're standing there, you need to remind yourself that this is the word of the Lord. You should go forward. God's building a way right through the low places of your life. God's providing a way right through the seeming defeats of your life. You say, I've been hurting so long, I'm tired of hurting. While you're hurting, uh, hear me. God's making a way of escape for you. God, why would you lead us to a grave? Oh, it's not a grave. Quit feeling sorry for yourself. Get up. Start going forward. What you think of as a, low, uh, as a low place is really a highway. Because God's in the business of building highways in low places. Moses, quit crying. Get up. Tell the people, go forward. Take the rod I gave you. I didn't ask you to do something I did not empower you to do. Take the rod that I gave you. <laughs> go to the lowest place in your life. Hold that rod out. Stretch your hand out over the sea. The children of Israel shall go on dry ground through the midst of the sea. It's so easy to isolate yourself in your troubles. Yes, 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 yes. Give me a good nod. It's so easy to isolate yourself in your troubles. It's so easy to feel alone in your suffering. Yes, yes. It's so easy to feel like the most healthy thing you could do was to sit down on your couch and let your mind go in this dysfunctional circuit whereby you count up the pain, the losses, the hurts. And they're real. I want you to know God builds highways in low places. There's a... I enjoy... Uh, I enjoy spirituals the old songs that came out of african-american christian of, of christianity their experience of christianity i should say uh, and it's quite unique because when most of them were brought to america to america to the caribbean to other parts of the world uh, they weren't christians when they came but they came and in spite of being oppressed by so-called christians you know how hard it is to receive the faith of someone who you know is a dirty dog let me tell you, that's pretty hard. That's pretty hard. In fact, you want to make sure 
Some people will never darken the door of a church again. You treat them in a certain way. They will never darken the door of a church again. In fact, go on the internet and read all the things written about the church. Those people know zero about theology. They know zero about mercy, but someone in a church heard them. Okay, so. Imagine this, this Christian tradition of, of growing up among slaves who are seeing through the ugliness of their so-called Christian masters and they're saying, look, there's, there's more here than these guys who are... And they're buying in. And out of that comes these spirituals that they would sing. And I, I, I have several I sing. Uh, you catch me on a bad day, you might hear me sing, especially if I'm kind of trying to make myself laugh, which is one of my coping mechanisms. Uh, you might hear me sing, I'm coming up on the rough side of the mountain. I'm doing my best to make it in. You guys wouldn't understand that song because y'all ain't never been through nothing. It's just us up here who have gone through stuff. But uh, pretty popular Christian artist, Vicki Winans, uh, she wrote a song, and it's not a hymn. It's, to my understanding, it's not a spiritual itself, but she wrote it in the style of a spiritual, where it has that call and answer style, which is very much a spiritual uh, uh, song ty- style. And and I I now you catch me on a bad day. I sing this song a lot. Okay, this is one of my songs, and it refers directly to the difficulty, the trouble, the confusion, all the stuff where you look that way and there's no answer 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 that way but God says to get up and stop feeling sorry for yourself and go forward and believe and claim faith and speak to the mountain and speak to the sea now you guys have heard me sing this before I've been lied on cheated talked about mistreated I've been used I've been scorned I've been talked about sure as I'm born I've been up I've been down I've been leveled to the ground but as long as I've got King Jesus as long as I've got King Jesus forgive me okay I, I got to do it as long, as long, as long, as long. I don't need nobody else. Yeah, you're hurting. Yeah, you've got doubt in your life. Well, yeah, you got stuff in your life. You need to get up and you need to go forward because God will build you a highway in the low places of your life. How, how can I preach it? Here, I'll tell you how. Number one, he's a burden bearer. He's a heavy load share. He's a bridge over troubled water. Good God. <laughs> he's my doctor. He's my lawyer. He's my friend when I'm friendless. He's my mother when I'm motherless. Sorry, Mom. As long as I've got King Jesus. He's a lily of the valley. The bright morning star. He's the rose of, he's a rose, I said. He's a grave, I am. He walks with me. He talks with me. Jehovah Jireh, Jehovah Rapha. He's an alpha. He's omega. He's the beginning. He's the end. He's my first, my last He's my very best friend. I call him in the morning. I call him in the evening. Jesus, oh Jesus. Yeah, she says it. Jesus, oh Jesus. I love him. I adore him. If you want him, I've got him. As long as I've got King Jesus. As long as I've got King Jesus. Hear me. Let's all stand. Let's all stand. Hear me. The way, the way maker will provide for you. It might be right through your tears. It may be right through your pain. You may stand with the children of Israel and say, I didn't ask for this. I never wanted this. 
I prayed for deliverance and you gave me this. It may be that your tears are your path to the promise because he did not take them through the land of the Philistines. He took them the way of the wilderness. And you've got to speak faith in your life. And you've got to speak faith to your pain and to your tears. I know I'm preaching a long time. I don't care. I'm fired up. So forgive me. You are going to make it through your tears, through your depression, through your discouragement. He's a way maker. He's a load bearer. He's a friend that's sticking closer than a brother. As long as you've got Jesus. I'm going to invite you right now. Step out of the seat you're standing in. Step out right now. I'd like all of us to come. I'd like our friends and guests, feel free to come with us. We won't embarrass you and make a scene out of you. None of that. You'll be perfectly safe. Trust me. If you do something crazy, that's on you. We won't do it to you. Okay? Well, let's all come if we will. We do this. We stand together. As we come right now, I would like you to be vulnerable in the presence of God. Would you open your heart? Would you open your heart? Thank you for watching First Church Charlotte.